Question 31. Company ABC has total assets of $6.2 million with liabilities of $2.2 million. If its shares are trading for $17.78, there are 450,000 outstanding shares in the markets. Then ABC's book value is closest to. So let's pull in our book value formula, and it's essentially going to be what our equity is. So our book value is just going to be those assets, the total assets, which were given at $6.2 million. Subtract out the liabilities of $2.2 million. We're left with $4 million in book value, so we can go with A. Um, the other numbers that were given, so what the stock is trading at and the number of shares outstanding, we would use that to calculate the market value. Um, but we just need the balance sheet numbers for book value. Question 32. A firm will start paying dividends four years from now, and after that, the dividend is expected to grow at the rate of 7% into perpetuity. The expected dividend in year four is $6 if the market's required rate of return for the stock is 12%. The intrinsic value of the stock is closest to. So we've got $80 and some change, $85 and $128. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be you, we're going to be using the cash flows function on the calculator, which is why I have the calculator pulled up, and we're basically going to be discounting all these dividends that were paid in the future, um, and then using the Gordon growth model to find the expected value of the stock, and then from there um, we'll discount that back at the required rate of return, and that's going to give us our answer. So for cash flows, for cash flow in years one through three, because we're not paying dividends until four years from now, our dividend is going to be zero. So we put that at a frequency of three. And then for cash flow two, which is basically year four, we're going to take that $6 dividend that we're receiving, and then we're going to add that to our expected value of the stock, which we get using the Gordon growth model. So let me pull that in. Oh, lost my calculator. All right, so we've got the expected value of the stock using the Gordon growth model, which is gonna be the that D1. So this is DO6 times one to, uh, plus the growth rate, which is given at 7% into perpetuity. Then we're dividing that by the required rate of return minus the growth rate to get our terminal value of 128.4. Notice this is the answer we get in C um, but we need to discount that back to the present value. So we've got our 128.4 plus 6 gives us our cash flow of 134.4. Uh, make sure we don't have any other cash flows in there. Then we'll go to the NPV. Plug in 12 as our discount rate and compute that. We get NPV of 85.4136, uh, which gives us answer B. Question 33. Which of the following is the most appropriate definition of inertia in relation to capital allocation pitfalls? A. Failing to consider alternative investments. This is one of the pitfalls related to capital allocation, um, which makes this a little difficult. However, it's not related to the definition of inertia. This is a, just a different pitfall, so we can go ahead and cross that off. B, increasing capital investments every period with falling investment returns. This is going to be our correct answer. Inertia is one of the common pitfalls of the capital allocation process, and um, this occurs basically when this definition happens, when management keeps investing more and more capital. Um, they have more and more capital invested in the investment, and so they want to salvage that even though investment returns may be falling. Um, so this is likely going to be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out C. Management considers internally generated capital different from externally generated capital. Um, this is also one of the capital allocation pitfalls, and management should be considering all of this the same. But again, like A, it's not related to uh, inertia. So we will stick with answer B. Question 34. BCG Bank has a one-month value at risk, or VAR, of 600 million with a probability of 7%, which means. So value at risk definition is gonna be the measure of the potential loss on a portfolio of assets given a certain level of confidence in a specific period of time. And so it's going to be, um, basically another way to interpret this is gonna be 
A one month VAR of 600 million means we think there's a 7% chance that the bank will experience a minimum loss of that 600 million. So this is going to be 7%. That'll be the minimum loss. So we've got A, a one month maximum loss of 600 million will incur 7% of the time. So this is going to, this is giving us max, not minimum. So we can go ahead and cross that off. B, a one month minimum loss of 600 million will occur 7% of the time. That sounds like what we just described. And then C, a loss of 600 million will occur one month from now. This is, the problem with this is it's not giving a probability, it's just saying it's gonna happen, which we um, can't say for certainty. So we will go with B, one month minimum loss of 600 million. Question 35, which of the following reasons is least likely a reason why a company's capital structure targets use book value instead of market value? A, market values change dramatically. This certainly is a reason why we would use book value instead of market value. The market values have a lot more baked into them, like um, sentiment and expectations of the company relative to other companies in the market um, and what the economy is doing in general, whereas the balance sheet is going to be that, uh, or the book value is going to use that balance sheet information and more so in isolation. So we'll cross that off. B, um, lenders and agent, rating agencies use book values in their calculations. This is also correct. They're using, they're looking at the balance sheet, not the uh, market, uh, to find book value, not the market value. So we'll cross that off as well. And then C, the amounts and types of capital invested by the company is not of significance. This is going to be our correct answer. The uh, type of capital we have is certainly of significance, so we'll go with C. And another just note on this is market values can often get distorted from the fundamentals of the actual company. And so if a company's market value runs up, but the, um, like in the dot-com bubble where they're not going to have sustainable revenues or assets to back those market values, then this is going to distort um, what we think of the company from a uh, capital structure standpoint. So we want to look at that book value since this is um, going to be more tangible in what we have. Question 36, Leopold Bank is currently trading at $53 after declaring a dividend of 3.1 per share for next year with an expected growth of 5%. If the investor's required rate of return is 11%, Leopold Bank is most likely. So we are going to use our Gordon Growth model, which it looks like we're given all of the inputs. So we're given um, the dividend for next year, which will be our D1. So we don't need to multiply that by the growth rate at all. And then we have growth rate G 5% uh, and investors required return 11%. So we're going to calculate this and then we're going to compare that to the $53 that it's currently trading at to determine whether we're overvalued, fairly priced or undervalued. So if we, if um, our, if our intrinsic value that we find is less than the stock, less than it's currently trading, we're going to say that it's overvalued. If it comes out to exactly 53, we'll say it's fairly priced. If we think the intrins if we find the intrinsic value to be over 53, then it'll be undervalued. So let's pull that in and we can take a look at those numbers. So we've got that 3.1 dividend and we divide that by 0 0.06, giving that uh, using that R minus G gives us 51.66. Um, so since 51.7, just rounding up, is less than 53, which is the current price, therefore the stock is overvalued. So we will go with answer A. Question 37, Turkish Gold is planning a new project. The cost to build the new mine is 1.1 million, paid at the end of the first year. And the mine should bring cash inflows of 510, 510,000 over the next four years years two to five. The cost to close down the mine over the following year is going to be 220,000. The minimum price for this land, if Turkish gold wishes to sell it now, given a 12% required rate of return is closest to. So we're gonna be using the cash flows function on the calculator. In the years they're giving us are key here. So we see we've got 1.1 million paid at the end of the first year. So our cash flow zero is gonna be zero. Our cash flow one is going to be that payment. If you were to put um, that minus 1.1 million into the cash flow zero and go from there, you're going to get the wrong answer. So you got to pay attention to the years those cash flows fall in. 
So then from there, um, we've got 510 for four years, years two to five. So we'll be just putting frequency of four there. And then it's going to cost us 220 to close down the mine. Um, that's just frequency of one. No more cash flows in there. Now we go to NPV, discount rate of 12. And we go down and hit compute. And we see we'll get 289477. Answer A. Question 38, which of these is least likely a secondary source of liquidity? So secondary sources of liquidity are going to follow our primary source of liquidity, which are typically going to be any cash or cash equivalents we have, um, or lines of credit, uh, short-term debt that we can kind of pull on to for fund operations. If there's a shortfall there, then we're going to need to look at these secondary sources, um, which are typically not going to be too favorable for the company since it's going to uh, entail some type of additional debt needed, which could burden the cash flow or earning power of the future company or maybe uh, asset sales. So with that in mind, let's take a look at these answers. A, filing for bankruptcy. This could definitely be a secondary source of liquidity. It would allow the company to restructure its debts um, and potentially be able to make them those interest payments more affordable uh, for the cash flow that the company is producing. So we'll cross A off. B, secondary equity offering. This is going to give liquidity to investors, not the company. Um, so this is probably going to be our answer since it won't be any source of liquidity for the firm. C, renegotiating, renegotiating debt contracts. This is also a secondary source of liquidity and it's going to signal worsening financial health if we're not able to kind of meet our current debt obligations. So we'll go with B. Question 39. Which of the following bond issuing mechanisms does an investment bank have the highest risk? A. Auction. In an auction, there's going to be no risk for an investment bank. This is just public um, placing bids on the bonds. So the bank investment bank isn't having to take any risk here. B. Best effort offering. There's also going to be no risk here for the investment bank, and that's because they're agreeing to basically take their best effort um, and sell the offering, but they're not agreeing to buy any of the bonds like in an underwritten, underwritten offering. And so that leads us to answer C. In an underwritten offering, the firm is going to basically buy the bonds. Uh, the firm guarantees the sale of the bonds issued at the offering price and then is assuming higher risk um, because if they're not able to sell all of those bonds, then they're having to kind of cover any shortfall there. And so this is the uh, where they'll be taking on risk. Answer C. Question 40. A U.S.-based firm has a position in a European bond with a par value of $50 million. For a one basis point increase in yield, the market value of the investment changes to $57.85 million, and for a one basis point decrease in yield, the investment changes to $58.75 million. The price value of basis point for the investment is closest to. So our formula for this is going to be um, the price value if yields decrease. So we're given that as a decrease in yield. Um, gives us 58.75, so we'll plug that number in there. And then this is going to be the price value um, for an increase in yields, which gives us 57.85. And then we just take the average of those two, basically. Take the difference and then um, the average, divide by two. So when we do that, we uh, see we plug those numbers in, we get 0.450, answer C.